The Whistler. That whistle. The Whistler. I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now the Whistler's strange story. Decision. been far more logical had it happened in the springtime. In April, perhaps, with the rhododendrons blooming in Golden Gate Park. The kids playing ball on the green lawns and the maple trees coming to life again. Yes, spring in San Francisco would have helped explain part of it. But the rest would always be beyond logic and common sense. It wasn't springtime, it was November, with Christmas just around the corner. A cold, gray day with the steam sizzling on the radiators as he sat near the window of his office on the 20th floor of the Hamilton building, looking at an uninspiring assortment of x-rays of Mrs. Harrison's chest cavity. Excuse me, Dr. Evans? Mm Hmm? Oh, yes, Miss Carlton. Uh, Mrs. Harrison called again about the x-rays. Well, there's nothing wrong with her heart. All she needs is some fresh air. Shall I tell her that? No, I suppose I'll have to find her a disease with 20 letters. I'll call her. And there was another call from a Mrs. John Cameron. Cameron? Can you see her today? Is it important? Well, she says so. Yes, they all do. All right, make it 12.30. What about lunch? I'll have to skip it. Mrs. Cameron's heart is undoubtedly more important than my lunch. And you noted it down in the book simply, 12.30, Mrs. John Cameron. Later, when you had a chance to think, you decided if it hadn't happened so suddenly, it might not have happened at all. Perhaps that was part of it, Paul. The suddenness, the way it threw you off balance. But more than that, it was a black-haired girl with blue eyes standing by the window when you looked up from your x-rays a half hour later. You remember exactly how she looked. The turquoise dress with a gold belt and clip. The smart little felt hat accenting her dark hair. Making you realize in a split second what was wrong with all the girls you ever knew. She must have come in while you sat at the film illuminator looking at negatives and making notes. Evident mitral insufficiency, minor valvular lesion. You're Dr. Evans? Oh, right. I'll be with you in a moment. Request detailed cardiograph immediately. There we are. I'll just get rid of this stuff. Please sit down. Now, what can I do for... For... Hello, Doctor. I'm Carol Cameron. Carol Cameron? <laughs> the, uh, uh, my, uh, the nurse said uh, you were rather concerned about yourself. Oh, no, no, it, it, it's not about myself. It's, ab- it's about my husband, Oh, I see. John Cameron? Perhaps you've heard of him? Uh, stocks and bonds, isn't it? Yes, yes. A few too many for his own good, I'm afraid. Oh? He's, uh, He's been a- under a-, a terrible strain recently. And night before last, he had a rather severe attack. Uh, his heart? Yes, yes. Uh, Dr. Miles, our family physician, suggested that I see you about it. I see. Uh, well, tell me, uh, uh, where is your husband now? At home, in bed. Mm-hmm. Didn't uh, uh, Dr. Miles recommend a, a hospital? Well, John's awfully unreasonable. He wouldn't hear of it. He insisted that he'd be up and around in a day or two. Well, that is unreasonable. You'll, you'll see him, Dr. Evans? Yes, yes, of course. I'll be glad to. I'll do what I can. Oh. 
Just like that, Paul. A minute or so and she's gone. You look up, you see her, and 30 seconds later, she could ask if you'd mind going to the North Pole for her and you'd tell her you'd be glad to. All afternoon, you try to shrug it off. Tell yourself it's fantastic. But this is the sort of thing that keeps you away from second-rate movies. But that evening, when you call on John Cameron, it's still there. Lucinda Withers, the housekeeper, is waiting outside the door after you finish your examination. Oh, uh, where is Mrs. Cameron, Lucinda? She went out for a moment, sir. Mm. Tell me, is it serious? Yes, I'm afraid it is. I knew it. I could see it coming on. He's like a son to me, Doctor. I've been with the family for 20 years now. Since way before she came. Oh, I see. He was never like this before. Oh, what do you mean by that? She's not good for him. She worries him. Makes him nervous. Keeps him thinking about the 15 years between them. <clears throat> yes. Well, I, I'll have a prescription sent over in the morning. Uh, i better be going now. My taxi's waiting outside. Uh, you just keep him as quiet as you can, and uh, I'll check him again tomorrow. Very well, Doctor. Dr. Evans. Oh. Just a minute. I, uh, I wondered what happened to you. I was just about to go. I left instructions with the housekeeper. How is he? Angina pectoris. It's, it's quite serious, I'm afraid. Oh. He hasn't been taking very good care of himself. He's got to now. I see. Well, uh, must you go right away? Yes, I'm afraid I'd better. My taxi's waiting. Well, I thought it was waiting. Doesn't seem to be there now. That's odd. I told him to wait. I didn't even pay him. I, I'd be glad to take you. Can't understand. The car's right down at the curb. Oh, no, 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 no. I couldn't. It'll only take a minute to call another oh, cab. No. no, it's really no trouble. <laughs> All right. I'll get my coat. There you are, Doctor. Right to the door. It was awfully nice of you, Mrs. Cameron. All right. <laughs> Well, I, uh, I guess the next thing to do is <laughs> get out. Just, just a minute. I, I, I want to tell you I, I lied about the taxi. Huh? I told him to go. Why? Because I, I wanted to take you home. I, I'm, I'm very flattered. <sighs> That's all. I, I just wanted to tell you. It's, it's happened to you, too, hasn't it? Oh, yes. Look, uh, there's a friend of mine, a Dr. Andrews. He's an awfully good heart man. I'm sure he'll take the case. Please, please don't do that. What else can I do? It's only going to make it worse. I know, but you, you just can't throw away what's happened to us, can you? It'd be wrong it, to... It'd be wrong to do anything else, Carol. Is that what we're here for? To spend our lives looking for something that isn't there and then to suddenly find it. Throw it away. Oh, please, Carol. Well? Shall we forget it? I, uh... I... I'll be around tomorrow with the prescription. <laughs> So that's how it started, Paul. Yes, it was easy to analyze it, to list a million reasons why it was wrong. But the trouble was that when you were all through analyzing, it was still there, stronger than ever. You visit John Cameron the next day and the day after that. And before you know it, the days have grown into weeks. In the damp November night, you arrange to meet her secretly at a little French cafe on Washington Street. Leads to a lot more of them. The two of you at the little corner table, Henry reserves especially, not saying much, hardly realizing how the time has flown, that tomorrow is the day before Christmas. You know, that's one of my favorite Christmas hymns. Beautiful. Yes. Christmas, day after tomorrow. Uh -huh. It's hard to realize it. You're happy, Carol. Happy and miserable. Well, did you expect anything else? No, no, no. I knew it was going to be this way, Paul. It's just that I feel so helpless, and I'm, I... I'm glad you came tonight, Carol, because... Because I'm afraid this is going to be the last time. 
Oh, Paul. Don't you see how impossible it all is? We're both beating our heads against a stone wall. You're absolutely right, Carol. We are helpless. As I see it, the only thing we can do is try to be square with ourselves. Honestly, it just won't work any other way. No, I suppose not. John will probably hang on like this for years. Yes, he might, if he's careful. You know, Paul, it's terrible to feel this way. What way? I I just can't help it, Paul. I I almost wish he'd No, no. no it's no, true. Carol. It's true. I never loved him, Paul. My family thought he'd be good for me. I didn't want any part of I it. I know, I know, my dear. You don't have to tell me. He's unhappy and he's sick and he's miserable and he'll always be that way. Why should he Please, live? Carol. Now this is going to be the last time I mean it. I can get Dr. Andrews on the case next week. Oh, no. Look at me. Carol. Oh, it's going to work out somehow. The right way. Will you believe that? All right, Paul. If you say so. Yes, Paul, it was the only thing to do. The honorable thing. Approved 100% by the Medical Association. But it doesn't help you sleep that night. And it doesn't help the next day when you make your regular call on John Cameron. Examine him, find him the same. Leave his prescription bottle with Carol and go. Yes, it had to end, Paul. Because you were both beginning to think the thing that Carol almost said at the restaurant. That you both wished John would die. And then at ten o'clock that night... Hello? Dr. Evans. Yes? You must come at once, Doctor. Mr. Cameron's had an attack. I'll be right over, Lucinda. Now listen carefully. There's a bottle of amyl nitrate in the medicine cabinet in the bathroom. Break up a tablet in a handkerchief and make him inhale it. Is that clear? It's too late for that, Doctor. I'm afraid he's dead. With the prologue of Decision... Another strange story by The Whistler. And now back to The Whistler. Cameron is dead. But it hasn't affected you as you thought it would. There was something so sudden about it. It happened so soon after you and Carol had decided to call it off. After she'd almost said what you'd both been thinking. Yes, there's something wrong with it. It just feels wrong. That's why after you've examined him, you turn to Lucinda. Uh, Lucinda. Yes, Doctor. You were here when it happened. Yes. Mrs. Cameron had given him his medicine and gone to bed. I heard him call. Yes. What happened then? He'd been violently sick. Said his throat was burning. His throat was burning? Well, you must be mistaken. No, sir. And he was all doubled up with cramps. What's wrong? You must be. It's the truth, sir. Did you give him anything? No. It was my night out. And I'd only just come I in see. when... Excuse me a minute. Well, Paul? Don't go in there. There's nothing you can do now. I know. Well, it's over. Oh, Carol. Don't say anything, Paul. I don't want to talk about it or think about it anymore, ever. We've got to think about it. I know, it. I know. You don't have to tell me. He was all right this morning, just as well as could be expected. All right, Carol. What happens now? I... No, I, I, I won't say any more. You know what's ahead, I guess. Of course. I'll be all right. It's just... You, that... you better go to bed. You need some rest. I'll take care of everything. It's almost midnight when you get back to the office and take the prescription bottle out of your pocket. The one you took from Carol's medicine cabinet. 
You forget to take off your hat and overcoat as you throw a few pieces of laboratory equipment together. Dissolve the powder in water and make a test. A very simple test. decision, isn't it? You look down at the blank death certificate on your desk until the letters burn into your brain and you can see them when you close your eyes. It's the most important decision you'll ever have to make, Paul. Is that what we're here for? To spend our lives looking for something that isn't there and then to suddenly find it and throw it away? <laughs> Two o'clock, three, four. All you can do is sit and stare at the desk, trying to think it through. Your medical certificate's on one wall, the Hippocratic Oath in a neat black frame on the other. Six o'clock, seven, eight, and then your nurse arrives. What? Why, Doctor, you've been here all night. Yes. It's Cameron. He's dead. Well, it was only a matter of time. Yes. Yes, I guess it was. I'll make out the certificate. Death from natural causes, angina pectoris, acute. I... Yes, Doctor? Oh, oh, nothing. Hello? Carol. Yes, Paul? I've just filled out the death certificate. Heart disease? Yes. Do you... Do you think they'll investigate? You've got to be careful. Awfully careful. I will. Poison isn't easy to cover up, Carol. They'll find it in a second if they ever get suspicious. Now listen. I'll send the certificate over this morning. If nobody gets curious during the next week, I... I think we'll be safe. All right, Paul. But we mustn't be seen together under any circumstances. I don't want you even to telephone me if you can possibly help it. Okay? Okay. Well, that's all then. Good luck, darling. Hello, Evans. Well, hello, Miles. How are you? I'm a little puzzled at the moment. Thought I'd drop in for a minute. I certainly have a chair. Thanks. About Cameron, I've had a rather distressing experience. Oh? I've been their family doctor for some time, of course. I didn't know Mrs. Cameron before she married John some years ago, but I've always thought her a rather charming person. But she seems to be. Yes. You, um, you know her pretty well, Paul? Oh, well, naturally, in attending her husband. Yeah, of but... course. Do you think she's a woman of character? Yes, yes, I'd say so. So would I. Miss Lucinda Withers, however, seems to think she's a murderess. Now, what does that mean? I don't know. The woman was completely confusing. A lot of rambling, disconnected remarks that seemed to imply that uh, you and Mrs. Cameron were in love. Well, as you said, Miss Withers seems to be confused. Yes. Well, I just think, Paul, that you ought to do something about Miss Withers. You know as well as I that this sort of thing can ruin you. Hello. Hello, Carol. Yes. Listen, darling. You've got to get Withers out of town. Yeah. I know it'll make it look worse, but it's the only thing we can do. Now, where's her family? I know. Uh, well, that's good. Now, tell her she needs a rest, anything. I know it sounds crazy, but it's better than sitting around waiting for the axe to fall. Well, that's it. Good luck, darling. <laughs> You're walking on thin ice, Paul. You can almost hear it cracking under your feet, and it seems to be getting thinner. The funeral on Thursday, then Friday, Saturday, and Lucinda's still in town. Carol was right. It only made it worse to try and get her to leave. You're just waiting now. It's only a matter of time. And then, bright and early, Monday morning... Hello, Doctor. I'm Willard Stevens. How do you do? I'm afraid I... I'm John Cameron's cousin... 
flew out from New York. I see. I have a rather delicate problem on my hands. I hope you'll understand. I'll try to. About John's death. I had a letter from him indicating he planned to make certain changes in his will. He arrived just a day or two before he died. Does that suggest anything to you? No, I'm afraid it doesn't. You naturally ascribed his death to his heart condition? Yes, naturally. I realize it would be embarrassing for me to contest your diagnosis. I'm hoping you'll work with me and... In what? I had a talk with Miss Withers the night I arrived. She's a meddlesome old fool. Oh? How did you know? Uh, Dr. Miles told me. Does that answer your question? It answers that question. I assume you have others. Indeed, I have. And I'm afraid, Doctor, there's only one way to answer them. What's that? An exhumation and an autopsy. So that's it, Paul. It's all over, isn't it? The autopsy will undoubtedly be tomorrow, and after that, of course, there'll be a trial. The next decision is easy, isn't it? It would be useless to try and run away. It would never lead to anything. You and Carol could never find happiness with an axe hanging over your head. So the next day, during the autopsy, you sit at home quietly in the chair by the phone, waiting for it to ring. Hello? Hello, darling. Oh, is the autopsy over? Yes. They're waiting downstairs to take me to the coroner's office for the report now. Listen to me. Paul, would you do me a favor? Anything, Carol. Will you leave? Now? Leave? What do you mean? Look, if it's going to happen, there's no reason for it. For it happening to both of us. That's about the most ridiculous thing you ever said. Oh, Paul, please listen. Don't go with them, Carol. I'll be down there in an hour. But it's Carol. There's only one thing in the world right now. And when that's gone, I don't want to be here anymore. I hoped you'd say that. You keep your chin up, darling. I'll see you in an hour. Yes? I'm Dr. Evans. Oh, yes. This way. All right, Lieutenant. There he is. Just a minute, Miss Willis. Make him admit it. He's in love with her. It's been going on... I said just a minute. How about that, Doctor? It's written all over his face. He's in love with her. All right. All right. I am in love with Mrs. Cameron. So what? The Whistler will return in just a moment with a strange ending to tonight's story. And now back to the Whistler. So you stand there, Paul, shouting to the high heavens that you're in love with Carol, with all of them clustered around you like vultures. It doesn't seem to matter anymore, does it? In spite of your love for Carol... You know that sooner or later your sense of responsibility would have forced you to tell the whole story. There's a long silence. And then the police lieutenant slowly walks over to Lucinda Withers. All right, Miss Withers, now that we're all here, maybe you'll tell us why you tried to frame Mrs. Cameron. Why? Oh, I I don't know what you're talking about. On April 5th, you bought 100 grains of thiocyanate at the black and white farm at the end of Farrell Street, right? Why... I did no such thing. You signed Evelyn Jones on the register. That's a lie. Is this the woman, Mr. Thorson? Mm, That's the woman. I make a practice of remembering the faces of people who buy poison. Uh, Excuse me. I think I'd like to sit down. Uh, Sure, Doctor. Take a chair over there. Now, Miss Withers, why did you try to frame Mrs. Cameron? Why did you put poison in the medicine you knew she had to give him? I didn't. I didn't do it. Don't lie to me. Now, what did you do with the bottle? I didn't do anything with it. I left it in the... Oh, you did have the bottle, huh? Why did you try to frame Mrs. Cameron? 
Why did you try to frame her? She killed him. She killed him just as surely as if she... As if she put the poison in the bottle instead of you, that's it, isn't it? She didn't drop him. She never did. He was as good as dead. So you thought you'd finish the job and hang it around her neck? Lieutenant, I must see Mrs. Cameron. Where is she? In the next room, lying down. Go ahead, Dr. Evans. Now, Miss Withers, we're going to take this all down right from the very... Carol, I... You're looking for Mrs. Cameron? Yes, the lieutenant said... You're Dr. Evans? Yes, I am. Well, Mrs. Cameron's gone, but she asked me to give you a message, and she said she was waiting for you at the French restaurant on Washington Street. She said you'd know the place. Oh, yes, thank you. I know the place. Carol. Oh, Paul. Carol. Oh, please sit down, Paul. Here it is, the same table. As before. And we said it would never happen again. Yes, the nerve of us saying what will and won't happen. We were fools. Paul. I was the fool. Thinking all the time that you'd killed him. I know, but you had every reason when I think how I acted after it happened. But I thought it was you. You gave me his prescription that morning, and an hour after I gave it to him, he, he was dead. We were both wrong. It was Lucinda who killed him. She thinks she did. They say they'll have a better case against her if they let her confess it first before they tell her. Tell her what? Oh, when you brought the new prescription that morning, the old bottle was still half full. And that's the one she put the poison in. What? That's the way it happened, Paul. You see, you see, darling, I used the new bottle the night he died. That's why I was so sure you did it. The prescription was perfectly all right. There was nothing... Of course it was. Of course it was. And I was so sure he was poisoned. Those symptoms... Lucinda was lying, Paul, about the burning in his throat and the cramps. Don't you see? Then the autopsy was okay. There was no murder. No, there was no murder, Paul. You see, darling, your diagnosis was correct. John died of natural causes, just as you said on the certificate. in tonight's story were Kathy Lewis and Joseph Kern. The Whistler was produced by George W. Allen with story by Harold M. Swanton, music by Wilbur Hatch. This is Marvin Miller speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.